the Bible, and the Catechism, in a year. Day 117 From the Book of Judges Gideon surprises and routs the Midianites. Then Jerubbaal, that is, Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Herod, and the camp of Midian was north of them, by the hill of Moreh, in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand has delivered me. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home. And Gideon tested them, twenty-two thousand returned, and ten thousand remained. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many, take them down to the water and I will test them for you there, and he of whom I say to you, This man shall go with you, shall go with you, and any of whom I say to you, This man shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Every one that laps the water with his tongue, as a dog laps, you shall set by himself, likewise every one that kneels down to drink. And the number of those that lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, was three hundred men, but all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, With the three hundred men that lapped I will deliver you, and give the Midianites into your hand, and let all the others go every man to his home. So he took the jars of the people from their hands, and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel every man to his tent, but retained the three hundred men, and the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. That same night the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you fear to go down, go down to the camp with Pur your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pur his servant to the outposts of the armed men that were in the camp. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts for multitude, and their camels were without number, as the sand which is upon the seashore for multitude. When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade, and he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian, and came to the tent, and struck it so that it fell, and turned it upside down, so that the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon the son of Joash, a man of Israel, into his hand God has given Midian and all the host. When Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped, and he returned to the camp of Israel, and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided the three hundred men into three companies, and put trumpets into the hands of all of them in empty jars, with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, Look at me, and do likewise, when I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and shout, for the Lord and for Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, when they had just set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars, holding in their left hands the torches, and in their right hands the trumpets to blow, and they cried, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. They stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the army ran, they cried out and fled. When they blew the three hundred trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow and against all the army, and the army fled as far as Beth Shitta toward Zerera, as far as the border of Abel Mahola, by Tabith. And the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from all Manasseh, and they pursued after Midian. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and seize the waters against them, as far as Beth Bara, and also the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were called out, and they seized the waters as far as Beth Bara, and also the Jordan. And they took the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb, they killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the wine press of Zeb, as they pursued Midian, and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon beyond the Jordan. Gideon's Triumph and Vengeance And the men of Ephraim said to him, What is this that you have done to us, not to call us when you went to fight with Midian? And they upbraided him violently. And he said to them, What have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abizer? 
God has given into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb, what have I been able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger against him was abated, when he had said this. And Gideon came to the Jordan and passed over, he and the three hundred men who were with him, faint yet pursuing. So he said to the men of Succoth, Pray, give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are faint, and I am pursuing after Zeba and Zalmanna, the kings of Midian. And the officials of Succoth said, Are Zeba and Zalmanna already in your hand, that we should give bread to your army? And Gideon said, Well then, when the Lord has given Zeba and Zalmanna into my hand, I will flail your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. And from there he went up to Penel, and spoke to them in the same way, and the men of Penel answered him as the men of Succoth had answered. And he said to the men of Penel, When I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. Now Zeba and Zalmanna were in Karkar with their army, about fifteen thousand men, all who were left of all the army of the people of the east, for there had fallen a hundred and twenty thousand men who drew the sword. And Gideon went up by the caravan route east of Noba and Jogbaha, and attacked the army, for the army was off its guard. And Zeba and Zalmanna fled, and he pursued them and took the two kings of Midian, Zeba, and Zalmanna, and he threw all the army into a panic. Then Gideon the son of Joash returned from the battle by the ascent of Hears. And he caught a young man of Succoth, and questioned him, and he wrote down for him the officials and elders of Succoth, seventy-seven men. And he came to the men of Succoth, and said, Behold Zeba and Zalmanna, about whom you taunted me, saying, Are Zeba and Zalmanna already in your hand, that we should give bread to your men who are faint? And he took the elders of the city and he took thorns of the wilderness and briars and with them taught the men of Succoth. And he broke down the tower of Penol, and slew the men of the city. Then he said to Zeba and Zalmanna, Where are the men whom you slew at Tabor? They answered, As you are, so were they, every one of them, they resembled the sons of a king. And he said, They were my brothers, the sons of my mother, as the Lord lives, if you had saved them alive, I would not slay you. And he said to Chetera's firstborn, Rise, and slay them. But the youth did not draw his sword, for he was afraid, because he was still a youth. Then Zeba and Zalmanna said, Rise yourself, and fall upon us, for as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon arose and slew Zeba and Zalmanna, and he took the crescents that were on the necks of their camels. Gideon's Idolatry Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, you and your son and your grandson also, for you have delivered us out of the hand of Midian. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you, the Lord will rule over you. And Gideon said to them, Let me make a request of you, give me every man of you the earrings of his spoil. For they had golden earrings, because they were Ishmaelites, and they answered, We will willingly give them. And they spread a garment, and every man cast in it the earrings of his spoil. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was one thousand seven hundred shekels of gold, besides the crescents and the pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian, and besides the collars that were about the necks of their camels. And Gideon made an effort of it and put it in his city, in Ophrah, and all Israel played the harlot after it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. So Midian was subdued before the people of Israel, and they lifted up their heads no more. And the land had rest forty years in the days of Gideon. Death of Gideon Jerubbaal all the son of Joash went and dwelt in his own house. Now Gideon had seventy sons, his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine who was in Shechem also bore him a son, and he called his name Abimelech. And Gideon the son of Joash died in a good old age, and was buried in the tomb of Joash's father, at offer of the Abiezrites. As soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and played the harlot after the balls, and made Baal Bareth their god. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had rescued them from the hand of all their enemies on every side, and they did not show kindness to the family of Jerubbaal, that is, Gideon, in return for all the good that he had done to Israel. From the Book of Psalms A Song of Victory O oh, give, thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say. His steadfast love endures forever. 
let those who fear the Lord say. His steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. With the Lord on my side I do not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side to help me. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord. Than to put confidence in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord. Than to put confidence in princes. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They blazed like a fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord I cut them off. I was pushed hard, so that I was falling. But the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Hark, glad songs of victory. In the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live. And recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sorely. But He has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. That I may enter through them. And give, thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank Thee that Thou hast answered me. And hast become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected. Has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech Thee, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech Thee, give us success. Blessed be he who enters in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God. And He has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches. Up to the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will give, thanks to Thee. Thou art my God, I will extol Thee. O give, thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For His steadfast love endures forever. From the Epistle of James Taming the Tongue Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, for you know that we who teach shall be judged with greater strictness. For we all make many mistakes, and if any one makes no mistakes in what he says he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body also. If we put bits into the mouths of horses that they may obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So the tongue is a little member and boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is an unrighteous world among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the cycle of nature, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by humankind, but no human being can tame the tongue, a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse men, who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brethren, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening fresh water and brackish? Can a fig tree, my brethren, yield olives, or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. Two kinds of wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good life let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This wisdom is not such as comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, without uncertainty or insincerity. And the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. From the Catechism 
Paragraph 3, The Church is One, Holy, Catholic, and Apostolic. This is the sole Church of Christ, which in the Creed we profess to be one, holy, Catholic and apostolic. These four characteristics, inseparably linked with each other, indicate essential features of the Church and her mission. The Church does not possess them of herself, it is Christ who, through the Holy Spirit, makes His Church one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic, and it is He who calls her to realize each of these qualities. Only faith can recognize that the Church possesses these properties from her divine source. But their historical manifestations are signs that also speak clearly to human reason. As the First Vatican Council noted, the Church herself, with her marvelous propagation, eminent holiness, and inexhaustible fruitfulness in everything good, her Catholic unity and invincible stability, is a great and perpetual motive of credibility and an irrefutable witness of her divine mission. The Church is One The Sacred Mystery of the Church's Unity The Church is one because of her source, the highest exemplar and source of this mystery is the unity, in the Trinity of Persons, of one God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Church is one because of her Founder, for the Word made flesh, the Prince of Peace, reconciled all men to God by the cross, restoring the unity of all in one people and one body. The Church is one because of her soul, it is the Holy Spirit, dwelling in those who believe and pervading and ruling over the entire Church, who brings about that wonderful communion of the faithful and joins them together so intimately in Christ that He is the principle of the Church's unity. Unity is of the essence of the Church. What an astonishing mystery! There is one Father of the universe, one Logos of the universe, and also one Holy Spirit, everywhere one and the same, there is also one Virgin become Mother, and I should like to call her Church. From the beginning, this one Church has been marked by a great diversity which comes from both the variety of God's gifts and the diversity of those who receive them. Within the unity of the people of God, a multiplicity of peoples and cultures is gathered together. Among the Church's members, there are different gifts, offices, conditions, and ways of life. Holding a rightful place in the communion of the Church there are also particular Churches that retain their own traditions. The great richness of such diversity is not opposed to the Church's unity. Yet sin and the burden of its consequences constantly threaten the gift of unity, and so the Apostle has to exhort Christians to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. What are these bonds of unity? Above all, charity binds everything together in perfect harmony. But the unity of the Pilgrim Church is also assured by visible bonds of communion. Profession of one faith received from the Apostles Common celebration of divine worship, especially of the sacraments Apostolic succession through the sacrament of holy orders, maintaining the fraternal concord of God's family. The sole Church of Christ is that which our Saviour, after His resurrection, entrusted to Peter's pastoral care, commissioning him and the other Apostles to extend and rule it, this Church, constituted and organized as a society in the present world, subsists in, subsisted in, the Catholic Church, which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with him. The Second Vatican Council's decree on ecumenism explains, for it is through Christ's Catholic Church alone, which is the universal help toward salvation, that the fullness of the means of salvation can be obtained. It was to the Apostolic College alone, of which Peter is the head, that we believe that our Lord entrusted all the blessings of the New Covenant, in order to establish on earth the one body of Christ into which all those should be fully incorporated who belong in any way to the people of God.